Welcome to episode six of the Photo Mind Talks podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yet again, we have another very special guest. Today we have with us Elizabeth Soine O'Neill. She's a genealogist and a writer and a speaker. Um, and she's going to speak a lot more with us today and tell us all about what she's been doing. And it's really, we're, we're so happy to have her here. Thanks so much for being here, Elizabeth. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to talk about my favorite topic. <laughs> What might that be? Genealogy, perhaps? Of course, of course. <laughs> With people who aren't bored and rolling their eyes. <laughs> well, I will certainly not be bored rolling my eyes because I'm so excited to hear about it. Um, I figure we might as well start off, you know, how you got involved in genealogy in the first place. I got involved in genealogy from my aunt, my paternal aunt. When she retired as a teacher, she decided that she was going to spend the rest of her time researching our family's history. I think that she had heard that there was some family legend that our family qualified for the Daughters of the American Revolution. And I guess she'd always wanted to join. And she started doing the research on the family. And I was the only one in the family that was interested, even a little bit. Nobody else was interested at all. So she would send me her finds. And when she came to California, she lived in Washington, but when she came to California, she would bring with her what she had been researching. And this was the late eighties, early nineties. So email was just becoming a thing and the genealogy research boards. So this was really at the beginning of the internet phase of genealogy. So she really roped me into it. And the other thing was that I felt I, I come from a small family anyway. So as my family members started passing on, I started feeling like, you know, the, the family was shrinking and shrinking and it just started feeling really small and discovering that there were these cousins out there and people that I hadn't known, you know, there's always some branch that was cut off because nobody wanted to talk to them anymore, but their descendants are, are great people. And it expanded my view of the small family that I had. So that's kind of what keeps me going now. That's great. So it was something you started with your aunt, was it something you just, you did together or was it something that she, like that you started together rather, or was it something that she started and then you kind of got attached to the she started project essentially. It, yeah, she started it first and she got a lot of the research done to join the DAR. And then she sent it to me and, and I joined after she did, but um, we got in, we got into it together and we would, as the internet was evolving with genealogy, we would send each other our finds and it, it became something that we did together. And I, I was so sad when she wasn't able to research anymore. And eventually when she passed on, because she was my family research buddy. But now you can do it on your own. You've got, I imagine you gathered, uh, you know, plenty of skills from sitting side by side with her, going through all these message boards and whatnot to find everything you needed. What, um, what was it like at like, uh, you know, this turning point in technology while researching for genealogy? Well, this was before family search before ancestry.com. This is when you had to go into the little family history centers and do the, you know, search on their in-house computers and print out on their dot matrix. I still have some of these old dot matrix printouts from, from going there and going to the National Archives and putting the films in and, you know, cranking the film machines. And, you know, in some ways it was it was more meaningful because you were closer to what you were researching. And, you know, I was in the archives and, and looking at these actual films instead of just sort of, oh, ho hum, here's another census on ancestry. So it, it was an, an effort that you had to make to research. Now it's, it's a lot easier. And I think that a lot of, especially newer genealogists really take for granted the wealth of what we have available right now. I mean, it is incredible. When I look at some of these old DAR applications and see, you know, they were writing letters to the National Archives to try to get copies of pension files and the amount of time that this was taking. And now we just pop onto fold three and there they are. And, you know, it's, it's incredible how it's evolved in the 
35 years that I've been doing research. It's got to make it a lot easier, especially, you know, now doing it on your own, as opposed to with a partner um, that you can, you know, go through these archives online. Uh, but at the same time, you definitely lose a little bit of that, you know, that companionship and the, almost that feel of like the work I imagine, right? Like, so you're actually going to the, uh, the National Archives, you know, the location closest to you to try to dig through things. It wasn't just like, uh, you know, sending a, a letter like, hey, can you send me this type of file? Well, when I was starting out, I lived near the National Archives building when it was in Laguna Niguel in California. It was in this big pyramid looking building and it was it's kind of intimidating but it yeah I would go there I think they were open maybe one Saturday a month and I would plan my one Saturday a month that would be archives day and I would go there and you know you had a limit to how long you could be on the machines because there were dozens and dozens and dozens of people in there all fighting for the machines <laughs> so research was a lot slower back then were you but I meeting, think we appreciated it more. That I mean, that makes sense. Were you meeting people you know, while you're going on your research days? Are you meeting other people who are have a you know, big interest in genealogy and talking about like, oh, like you should check here or maybe at that um, time, you know, different, nothing like that? Not so much. I think because I was young, I was in my 20s at that time. And it was... I don't think that the genealogy community was as welcoming to young people at that time. I mean, I hear a lot now that the community is not welcoming the young people. Back then, it wasn't really at all. I remember going to my first genealogy society meeting, and I was greeted at the door by somebody who said, "Um, are you sure you're here for the right meeting? Yeah. Isn't this the genealogy society? Well, yes. And they, you know, sort of eyed me like, what are you doing here? So I don't know if it was just me and my age or, you know, people were just, they were trying to milk every minute that they could out of being at the archives and facilities and they weren't really chatty. (laughs) (laughs) I guess that makes a little bit of sense. Was it hard to, at least in those uh, genealogy society uh, settings to kind of, you know, put your foot forward and kind of be a part of this once they, you know, got past the idea that you actually wanted to join in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think that everywhere I went, people questioned why I was there. My first DAR meeting, they looked at me and sort of gave me the eye and said, well, what makes you think that you can join the DAR? What's DAR? The, The Daughters of the American Revolution. And it was just, it was like the stigma of you're too young. What makes you think you can be here? And I, you know, I just want to say to young genealogists today, you guys have it so much better than we did back then. You know, we, we want you, we want you to be interested back then. They kind of wondered what we were doing there. Well, it's a good thing that there's the opportunity now. So let's take it back a little bit. So I know that you were a teacher beforehand. What kind of, took you from uh, this place of, oh, you know, this is something I do with my aunt. This is something I'm going to continue doing, you know, for my family's sake, because frankly, no one else is willing to, you know, do this with me even. Um, You know, what took it from this point of just loving genealogy and your family's history to turning into a real passion and something that you focused on? I think it was probably around the time I had my daughter and I started to really think of her family history. I mean, I had always loved genealogy and I had looked at it more as a hobby that I would do whenever I had time. But after she was born, I really started looking at it a different way. And I had, I had stopped teaching at that point. My husband and I relocated and I found out I was pregnant and decided, you know what, I'm just going to be a stay at home mom now. And sort of through being a stay-at-home mom and having, I wouldn't say extra time, but a little different time during the day, not being at at school teaching all the time, it, it gave me the opportunity. And also the internet had evolved to the point where you could really do a lot at home. You didn't have to leave home to do, to do your research. So I think all of those things sort of converging sort of led me to think, you know what? 
you could do this all the time instead of just, <laughs> just as a hobby. That's so fun. What are some surprising things you learned about your family along the way? Well, when I first informed my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, that I wanted to start doing family history research, she got really angry at me. And she told me I wasn't supposed to do that because there were family secrets and I wasn't allowed to know what they were. So, of course, to me, that said, there's family secrets. I need to find out what these are. <laughs> so I just went after the family research, especially on her side. And I discovered an ancestor on my my mom's father's side who was basically a pioneer in the temperance movement. And she, um, at that time in, I in Iowa, well, prohibition was just really getting going. And she, there was a new law that said that if your husband wasn't a habitual drunk, that the wife could go to the different pubs that he frequented and request that he not be served. So she did that. She told him don't serve. And he went one day and he went out with his buddies after work and he had way too much to drink. Then he got on the train to come home and he got off at the wrong stop, fell down drunk in the snow and nearly died. And he wow. ended up losing his fingers from frostbite, which was pretty bad because he was a tailor by trade. So, you know, not being able to sew anymore meant they didn't have any income. So she followed up on this law and she filed suit against all of the pub owners and it eventually went to the state Supreme court and she won. She didn't win a lot. She won about $6,000. This was back around 1906 and it made the national papers. I mean, she made, she made the papers worldwide. She was the first woman in that state to take advantage of this law. And I, just, I couldn't believe that nobody knew this. Why did nobody in the family know about this? She was, she was amazing. So wow, that's, that was, that's, that was that's such a exciting. story that gets passed down, right? That's not, that's like one of those things like, oh yes, of course, there's this one story we have. Um, but at the same time, you can understand why someone would perhaps be less interested in the story, right? There's like the, uh, the reason for it, but that's a, that's a pretty interesting thing to learn along the way. The so stories of the people who uh, were the lawbreakers and the, you know, who committed the crimes. Those are really the interesting ones. Well, it sounds like a Netflix documentary if I ever heard it. <laughs> but <laughs> so tell me, tell me a little bit about your site, Heart of the Family. <clears throat> well, Heart of the Family is probably an evolution of my past two websites. I started blogging in 2007 and it evolved into another site and it eventually evolved into heart of the family. And basically my goal there is to help other people take their ancestors out of their database and bring their stories into their life. And I do have a lot of um, posts about how to research because of course we need to be researching so we can find those stories. But what do you do next? Do you, do you let them just languish in your database or do you do something with those stories? So my mission is to help others make the past part of their present. Well, we like to hear that. At PhotoMind, we also think very similarly about making your past the, pre uh, the present as well. So um, I can definitely uh, agree with you about that. Is there... Um, have you had any interesting feedback from people, you know, that have seen your posts um, that maybe you've connected with that, um, you know, it, maybe you've helped them in a way that they weren't expecting or um, they discovered you in an interesting way, anything like that? I had a lady send me a comment the other day who had read a post that I had written about Melungeons and I had long kind of wondered if my own family had Melungeon ancestry. So I sort of did some research into that topic and she read the post and she was completely stunned by this, you know, oh my gosh, maybe I'm a Melungeon. Maybe this explains everything. And I thought, you know, I'm glad that you found this helpful to, to you. Maybe, maybe you are Melungeon. <laughs> wow. I think my, my number one post is the one about how to scan your 
negatives, your film negatives with your phone. So I think there's a lot of people out there who have negatives languishing in their house and they need to uh, process those. Well, that's how we found you in the first place, right? That's right. Is, uh, <laughs> as you, as you mentioned, film box in your article. So um, yeah. So actually one of the, one of the things, you know, we talked about before this um, is that, that I, I think it's like really fascinating because it never seemed like an avenue of genealogy and finding, you know, old family photos and all right, you assume that it's something that's in the basement or, you know, on your shelves or maybe in your grandmother's attic or something, uh, maybe even in a storage unit, but you don't expect to find them on eBay. And I know you kind of have like an interesting story about finding family photos on eBay. Yeah, I have been trolling eBay for a long time. <laughs> And, you know, the, eBay has kind of become the yard sale or the estate sale of the past. Instead of people putting these things out on their lawn, they're going on to the Internet, which is a real boon for the, those of us who especially don't live in the same area where our ancestors lived. So, yeah, I had had a, an alert on eBay for my maiden name, which is Swan A, and it's pretty rare. So I think I had gotten one hit before that and it was a typo in the uh, item description. <laughs> so it wasn't even relevant. But this one morning I was sitting on the couch with my coffee and I got this email saying this product with my maiden name had popped up and I looked at it and it was my great uncle's original marriage certificate. So I, of course, put the coffee down and headed to my computer to check things out more. And I, I looked at what this particular seller was selling, and he had several items. He hadn't listed them as being part of my family, but I could see in the photo that they had the name on them. So I wound up contacting the seller, and after a few exchanges and some photographs, he agreed to sell me the whole lot sight unseen. And that's how I acquired this, uh, like two packages of about 65 old negatives. Uh, I guessed that they were from an old 116 camera from around the early 20s into the 30s. They're the old four by fives. And I wanted to know what was on them. So that's how I got on into the uh, scanning of negatives. So that was my huge benefit of scanning these negatives. That's so great. Any, any images specifically stand out? Yeah, there's one of my grandfather and my grandmother, and they were probably in their twenties. They got married pretty early. And my aunt, my genealogy aunt, as I like to call her, was in that photo and she was probably about three or four so this image, she was born in 1918. So this image was from the early 20s. So I was able to date these, the majority of these negatives are about 100 years old. Wow. And the fact That's that so they cool. survived all this time through all they've been through for <clears throat> me to eventually buy them on eBay just, you know, still blows my mind. How did the seller come across them in the first place? Do you know? Yeah, he bought them at an estate sale. It was, uh, I think it, he said it was the Butler Mansion in Jonesboro. They had found these boxes of stuff in the attic. How it got there, I have no clue. But I guess sellers like him go to these sales and they just buy these boxes of stuff and then they resell them on eBay. So essentially, we it was a win-win for both of us because he didn't have to list all the items and I didn't have to wait to buy them on an auction so he just sold them all to me. Awesome. Do you know of other, uh, do you have any other friends or have you yourself bought any other uh, images off of, uh, you know, old family negatives, records, anything like that off of eBay? Or is this really the only lot that you've kind of uh, found? Oh, no, no. eBay is probably my dirty little secret. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before I, I connected with the seller and bought this lot of products or items, I used to buy a lot of other people's stuff. I would see photos. I, I have several photos of this from this nursing school and I have a scrapbook and my intent is to try to rehome them with family. 
but I just couldn't stand seeing them languishing on the internet. I mean, these were beautiful images of people, especially, you know, I have several of beautiful women who were nurses and their hair was incredible. And, and I know that people buy these things to cut them up and make what they call junk journals. They just sort of glue things in and make art with them. And as a family historian, I shudder to think that somebody's got my family's photos that they're making junk journals out of. So I bought several of those photos, scrapbooks. Uh, I have, I recently purchased a couple of out of print rare county histories for a project that I'm working on. Uh, one of my other favorites is cookbooks, regional cookbooks. I got, and they're, you know, people laugh at me. It's not because I'm, I'm planning to make moonshine in my backyard, which I do have a recipe for now, <laughs> but it's full of women's history, you know, the food. And, and this was the thing that drove the family was, was their food and their meal gatherings. And I purchased this one from an area that I'm researching and it's full of these old historic photos they're not labeled, unfortunately, but it gives me a good idea of what the area looked like in the past. So, you know, that combined with the food and the recipes, I, I just love the social history part of it. I mean, food is really one of those things, right, that no matter how old you are, how young you are, everyone can always find common ground with food. And it mm -hmm. tells you so much about, you know, where you're from or where that dish is from. There's such a there's so much roots in food that it makes total sense why you'd be so interested in finding these regional cookbooks. Any recipes that you like making yourself? Well, I'm getting ready to try my grandmother's cornbread. And this is a, a part that I'm adding to my website is heritage food. And my grandmother was kind of famous for her cornbread. So I was able to get the recipe out of my father and <laughs> I'm getting ready to make her cornbread. And I actually have her old cast iron cornbread pan. It's the one with the little corn ears in it. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. So That's I so cool. somehow managed to inherit that. And now I'm going to make Nana's cornbread in her cornbread pan. Well, that sounds like she'll be very happy that you'll be uh, making this, right? That you, can, if you especially so. if you do it in her pan, that's like a great tribute. I hope so. So, do you have any tips for anyone else out there trying to, uh, you know, research their own family history or try to help others to research their own family history? Anything like that? Look beyond the dash you know, be, people had lives. And I, I hear over and over again, people tell me, oh, well, my ancestors were really boring. They were just farmers. Well, my ancestors were farmers too, but I'm really fascinated by how they lived. It was so different than how we live now. And, you know, once you get those dates, you have the birth date, you have the death date, ho-hum, let's move on to the next ancestor. Don't Focus on them. What was their life like? Try to accumulate as much information about them as you can. And then write their story. See if you can find pictures about them and turn them into a person. And that to me is the most special part about family history is uncovering who they were. Not necessarily, as my grandmother said, you know, getting those skeletons out of the closet, although those are pretty interesting. But, you know, just like I'm, I'm fascinated lately by agricultural censuses. How much, how much hay did my great, great, great grandfather produce? You know, everybody else thinks that's so boring. But I think about all of his mills and, you know, he was this land baron in East Tennessee and he had all this land and these mills and he was making hay. And I found a court minutes section where he made a coffin for people and, you know, it just really uncovers who they were as a person. So go beyond the dates. I know when you're first starting out, you need those dates. You need to be connecting those ancestors. But then go back and take some time to really learn about who they were and then write their story. Oh, I, I get it. I know I told you this when we, you know, when we uh, had like our initial meeting last week about how I, uh, you know, I've been re I told you a little bit about how I've been researching a little bit of my family 
And I found out about a, a great uncle of mine who died in the war in the forties. And, um, and there was not that much known about it. He was very young. He was 17. And I found this like uh, a trove of letters basically from people who were close to him. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the most interesting ones was from a teacher who basically just talked about how he was as like, he, that he was kind and that he was like, that people seem to love to be around him, right? Those like little things that you don't get from worked in this office in 1937. Right. You don't get that from dates. You don't really get that even from, you know, probably like testimonials from people, right? You get that from the people who know them in a way that's beyond just, um, you know, what they did, where they live, things like that. So it's, um, that's what makes people special to you is, is who true. they were, what their character, not, you know, they were a private and company C of the first militia, you know? Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know, but what was their character? What did they do? How were they to other people? So. That's how we learn about people though. Right. That's how, you know, like we have conversation like this, so I can not only understand and hear more about genealogy, but also like it's a great way to understand what you care about and what you're like. Clearly, you are passionate for family, not only just researching family, but about family in general, right? Because you want to know these people so dearly. Well, I've spent a long time. I spent a long time looking for the names and the dates, and I think that you eventually evolve in your research to a point where that's not enough. I need to know more. I need to know who these people were. So that's, that's kind of where I am right now. I was marveling to my husband a couple of days ago. I have, I just purchased this three inch binder and I said, can you believe that all nearly all of the information, it's almost completely full is about this guy who was born in 1799. This is how much I know about this guy. Cause I have been relentless in finding out about his life. Thankfully, he left me a lot of clues, but. <laughs> so do you feel, you feel like you know your family pretty well, like on a scale of one to 10, based on the research you've done, how, how well you feel like you know your family? Or if you need maybe a bigger scale, we can do one out of a hundred. I think I know a lot about my family. I think there are still things yet to be uncovered, especially about living people or maybe the recently deceased because that information isn't quite as wi widely available but you know eventually that none of us have privacy anymore anyway so our descendants are probably going to be able to find out whatever they want but um yeah i would say uh, probably about an eight or nine i know my family and how many years back would you say that goes well, that particular line goes back to 1799, possibly wow. farther, but I haven't really been able to make it, make a good connection. I do have one line that's the Taylor line that's been really well researched into England into the early to mid 1500s. Oh, and I have a martyr who was burned at the stake. So that's another interesting story. <laughs> in England. Wow. So I don't qualify for the witches out here in in the United States, but uh, yeah, he, he wanted to remain Catholic after England turned Protestant and he wouldn't change his mind and they burned him at the stake. So he was murdered. Wow. The uh, yeah. A few centuries, you go a few centuries back and they, you really find some interesting stories. That's, that's really, it's really intense and quite a, quite a interesting part of your, of your family's history. Um, it's a hard life. I mean, if you think about what had to happen in order for you to be born, you know, one one little thing that maybe didn't happen as it did and you wouldn't be here today. It's pretty incredible. Well, science is pretty amazing. Science and technology really just really brought us a, a long, long way. And that include that's included for, you know, like we've been talking about researching your researching your family even. Right. Not just, mm -hmm. you know, actually being born and and living a healthy life, but being able to live a healthy life and research the family that you've had and, you know, how they live their lives. And, you know, the more, oh, yeah. the more information we have available to us, understanding truly how they live their lives, like down to, yeah. I imagine like the science of their, what they're eating, their diets. Like, you know, we're talking about recipes. Well, it should make us appreciate what we have 
I mean, I was putting some laundry in the washing machine the other day and grumbling about laundry day and thinking, well, my ancestors were probably banging their laundry against rocks in the creek. So it's pretty, I got it pretty good. So I can't complain. Yeah. Throw, throw some detergent in, press a button. It does the rinse and the spin all together. Oh, I have thing. to go get it out and put it in the dryer. Oh, no. <laughs> a tough life we live. Um, any, <laughs> any, any last words before we finish up? Oh, let me think. Try to find the joy in your family history. Um, communicate with other genealogists. Reach out to those cousins. See what you can find out. Become part of the community if you can. Um, I think the genealogy community is pretty welcoming, a lot more welcoming than when I first got started. So just join in and have some fun and see what you can learn about your family. Well, if someone is looking for a place to begin, they can certainly start with thefamilyheart.com and they can reach out to you. And uh, I imagine that you'll be very willing to uh, get them on the right path. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's been really interesting hearing about sure. your journey in ge genealogy and you know how you clearly are the torch a torchbearer for this community and you know so passionate about really getting to the roots of you know not only who you are but who your entire family is and hoping that everyone else can kind of find that place too. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure, Matthew. Well, that's going to do it for us for episode six of Photomind Talks. Again, we thank Elizabeth for being here. You can check out her website, thefamilyheart.com, to reach out to her. Also, you might find her speaking at various genealogy web uh, conferences and locations. Um, so you should definitely keep an eye out for her there. Um, and that's going to do it for us today. Thanks so much. <laughs>